Sometimes I feel like a marvelous child. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, we start the work of this session. And the whole audience is welcomed, especially the keynote speaker, Professor Sharon Todd, who is actually acting at Maynooth University in Ireland. My duty is, my task is to present her shortly on a concise way. Yeah. <clears throat> a technical remark. In the room number two, through the technique, it's uh, reachable, uh, the lecture. So if you don't want to, to listen to the lecture standing near the wall, you can choose the other possibility, go there. Uh, whole uh, or room number two. Yeah. <clears throat> the title is on the screen. The name of the keynote speaker on the on the screen. On the screen. Yeah. Nevertheless, I would like to as presents for you, the keynote speaker, some some words. <clears throat> Uh, drawing her professional profile, I have chosen the way to, to mention some of her uh, research topics and research fields. <clears throat> These are political and ethical aspects of education interculturalism and diversity issues, images of femininity and masculinity, and cross-cultural conflict to, to mention as, 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 the, as the latest. All these fields, all these topics, of course, can be treated, can be reached in many uh, methodologies, of course, from points of view from moral, social, cultural, or ontological, that is, philosophical points of view as well. <clears throat> My impression is, having some concise information about uh, the professional activity of Professor Todd, that uh, her habit as science, as, as, uh, as researcher, the, the most, the strongest element of her habit is the philosophical approach, philosophical approach. I am, don't know if I am, if I have, I am <laughs> right or not, but that is and that was my, uh, my impression. The main theme of the conference as a whole, that is education and transition, transition, the move from one state to another one in every sense of the world, implies change. And change implies always uncertainty, which is on the screen. Uh, do we like change? If you are frank, uh, we can say not so much. Not so much, to be quite frank. Why? Because the change is always or can be or is always all colored a little bit with the feeling of anxiety and fear as well. So, in this situation where we are actually, the clear words, 
clear statements, clear interpretations inspired by the wisdom of philosophy are seem to be, not so much seem to be, but are very, very necessary. And we hope that we'll hear uh, such clear words and clear statement from Professor Sharon Todd. Will you be so kind to take the floor? Thank you very much, Laszlo. Um, I'm not so sure that I will be so clear, uh, but we hope so. I'll keep my fingers crossed on that one. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you to the ESER uh, committee that invited me to give this keynote. It is quite a privilege to be able to address my colleagues um, like this, so many of you, and uh, uh, you know, and others that are sitting in a room that I cannot see. So, hello to you as well. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I want to thank you for taking an hour out of your life uh, to come and hear what I have to say. And like most uh, talks that go on in these kinds of fora, where the air leaves something to be desired, I promise not to go right to three o'clock. So, uh, so I'll give you plenty of time, and, and I was hoping that maybe we could have some kind of a discussion afterwards, but there's very little floating mics around from what I'm, from what I'm gathering. So hopefully I can meet up with some of you uh, afterwards more informally, and um, I'm just hoping that something of my talk resonates uh, with some of you some of the time. So that, that's my big ambition today. So, uh, as you notice, I changed the title just slightly. Um, I put a, sort of a subtitle on. Can people hear me? Is this okay, this kind of level? Of, yeah? Oh, oh, the thumbs up. Okay, thank you. Um, so, it's beyond the harmonies of Eurovision education, and you'll see what I'm doing as I'm going to be playing with this idea of some kind of a unified or, or har harmonized education system uh, at that, or educational policy in Europe. Uh, so I'm going to give you a sense of the overall position I'm going to be taking here on education and tr transition. Um, I think European anxieties over the precariousness of the future has led to increasing regulation and measurement of skills and competences for students in an attempt to kind of suture over transitions from school to higher education and from educational institutions to the labor market. Um, and what this focus on transition seems to be concerned with is how education can help make things go as smoothly as possible. Uh, so that integration uh, with what one is transitioning into uh, is, can be achieved. But no matter how well-intentioned and possibly necessary we think such integration might be, the framing of the relationship between education and transition worries me. It leaves little room, in my view, for thinking about education itself as a process of transition, transformation, and change. And I'll be talking about the, those, those three terms. So that is, I will be arguing education is not only about servicing various kinds of transition, but is itself a transitional and transformational practice. And I'm going to be putting a lot of emphasis on that term practice. And more to the point, I will be suggesting that if we think of education in terms of change and not merely about making change less painful, then our capacity for dealing with uncertainty about the future, the economy, as well, about, as well as about ourselves, actually invites a different kind of relation to the kinds of research we do and the educational policies we hope as academics to influence. And it actually gets to the heart of what I am calling the existential condition of education. So that's basically kind of what, what the position that I'm, that I'm coming from. And I want to show you a little bit of the outline here. I can't see what's on the PowerPoint at any one time, so you'll have to excuse me if I keep uh, turning, turning around here. And I just want to walk you through the, the outline uh, a little bit here. Uh, at first, I'm going to be uh, talking about the European context of education and calling it the Eurovision, uh, Eurovision education. And I'm going to be particularly looking at the uh, Education and um, Training 2020 guidelines that has just come out in a document, uh, a joint report actually, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I'm going to sort of outline what I see is problematic about where that relationship is going. 
um, and then I'm going to be looking at shifting, what, making two shifts that I think are absolutely central for thinking a little bit differently, for singing a different kind of song. Uh, and then the, the, the third and the fourth sections are going to get a little bit more perhaps philosophical, giving you a slightly more philosophical justification, kind of fleshing out my position a little bit more thoroughly, uh, looking at particularly the idea of transition and what it means for uh, education. And then uh, looking at uh, the getting more deeply into notions of uncertainty and change. And here I'll be drawing on uh, Buddhist philosophy as well. Uh, and then I want to end very quickly with uh, the idea of, of uh, singing out as a, as a way of thinking about uh, uncertainty as a research and policy task within education. So, singing the right song or Eurovision for European Education 2015. So I want to start off this contextualization by underscoring the push toward commonality underlying policies concerned with education and transition. Guy Neve, back in 2003, makes an astute comment about this relationship in the higher education sector. He writes, it could be argued with no little weight that the past two get decades for Europe as a whole have been a saga of vast and never-ending transition to market economy, to strategic management, to new managerialism, toward the evaluative state, towards agency control, a veritable procession, a decade or more long, singing songs of expectation, accountability, and diversification, variously applied to such areas as funding, students, and types of establishment now gathered under the general rubric of higher education. Now, Neve's comments have proven to be not only apt, in my view, for higher education, but for the field of education, more broadly speaking. The song he writes off might not seem too dated, at least just yet, even though the lyrics were written before the numerous economic collapses we've witnessed since 2008, the increased influence of OECD and PISA on government regulation of education systems, and even before the phrase circular economy was in currency at the EU. But what he points to is the difficulty or inability for governments to sing out of tune or to opt out of the choir altogether. In the harmonization of European educational policy around transition, and this is what I'm calling the Eurovision education, governments are expected to comply with and indeed are involved in the construction of, so they're com uh, you know, complacent in as well, uh, a whole range of assumptions that view what counts as education in a very particular manner. And that's what I'm going to be looking at. What kinds of assumptions about education are these documents actually making? So in a joint report of the European Council and Commission just released on uh, August 26 of this year, the EU outlines its concerns with transition for youth from education to work and its objectives for education and training 2020, what I'll be referring to as ET 2020. ET, that's very strange, but anyway, uh, it sounds outer space-ish, but you know. Uh, I want to spend a little time mapping out what is at stake in the document from the point of view of uncovering assumptions about what kind of education is being claimed here. And so that's the, the, the report. So the joint report discusses the significance of identifying principles that will anticipate and meet the rapidly changing needs of labor markets and that will support the transition to a circular economy. Moreover, the report states that such priorities are seen within a context where, quote, inequality is at its highest level in 30 years. That, that neoliberalism uh, and, and the kinds of, what, what has been driving education has also occurred within the past 30 years, I don't think is a coincidence. To respond to these large and expansive economic conditions, it is recommended that what needs to be focused on are six priorities for education which largely emphasize the development of skills and competences across a number of areas. And so, here we go. Uh, I'll go through each one of them. So we have relevant and high quality skills and competences focusing on learning outcomes for employability, innovation, and active citizenship. Inclusive education, social cohesion, equality, non-discrimination, and promotion of civic competence open and innovative education and training, strong support for teachers, transparency and recognition of skills and qualification to facilitate learning and labor mobility, and sustainable investment 
performance, and efficiency of education and training systems. Now, these are the six priorities that are going to be guiding educational policy in the future uh, in Europe. And I want to focus on one, two, and six in, in, in particular here. So if you look at the language, uh, we're talking about transversal skills, key competences, reigniting long life uh, learning strategies, promoting transitions, and that kind of thing. Skills and competences are you know, obviously high on the agenda. When it comes to two, the language, although it has a few competencies, is really uh, aspirational. It talks about tackling or grappling with or promoting. It doesn't really talk about anything more concrete. And if any one of those strategies, it seems to me, uh, needs to be looked at in detail, particularly in light of the refugee, current refugee crisis, it would be this one, surely. Um, and number six, when we look at the, what, what sustainable investment means, it's about attracting private actors into the education system. It's about attracting capital into education. It's evidence-based policy making and performance-based funding and cost sharing. So there's just no way in which you can get around the kind of the performativity kind of culture, obviously, that that, that Eurovision education is actually promoting. So what is clear from the report is that the language of education is a language that has been hijacked by assumptions about efficiency, behavior, and management. Education as a term has not only been reduced to learning, as Gert Biesta has claimed, but learning itself has been given a narrow bandwidth, becoming that which we can see and measure through outcomes, outputs, and performances. But what is really new here? This seems to be an old tune, playing for the better part of almost 30 years. The neoliberal critiques uh, written in the 1990s pointed to similar constellations of terms and vocabularies. What I think perhaps might be relatively new lies not so much in what this kind of uh, document says, but in what it does. And it's become a uniform voice for education on this continent leaving very little room for alternative voices, both national and community-based, to be heard. And I think partly that's, it's also not just a, you know, a lack of political will or anything, I also think it's because of the way in which it is articulated with other strategies at the EU level. It makes it very, very hard to disentangle uh, these, these ki this kind of rhetoric. And secondly, the Eurovision education is concerned with controlling social uncertainties. It actually assumes that education can assuage the problems of the economy, the social field, and political participation through the learning of certain skills and competences. Not only does this, as Hannah Arendt has claimed, put the burden of fixing the world inappropriately on the youth who have had no hand in creating its problems, but it also suggests, in my view, an inability to tolerate uncertainty itself. This inability then leads to a delusional sense of education as being that which can stabilize uncertainty. Under this logic, it is no wonder that education becomes instrumentalized. However, what I would be suggesting instead is that a shift to seeing education itself as a process fundamentally engaged with uncertainty actually makes it more and not less valuable than seeing it as a vehicle for skills management and training. So that's going to be my sort of position here, that because education actually is about processes that involve uncertainty, and, and I'll be going into more sort of kind of existential uncertainty and transformation, then actually if we could just allow education to be uh, it actually might be responding much more effectively to the kinds of alienation and disaffection uh, that youth are, are currently undergoing. So what I want to look at now is shifting the Eurovision tune, and I'll be making two uh, shifts here. So if we look at the problem as I see it crystallized in this report, what is driving current policy is a desire to stabilize social uncertainty by instrumentalizing education as a practice through which one comes to learn certain skills and competencies that can then be transferred onto the social field. Education becomes the handmaiden, or the backup vocals, if you will, for policy agendas framed by social and economic problems. 
Education, appear, it appears, does not exist on its own terms, but only in relation to social slash economic conditions. It is supposed to be ameliorating. So it's getting, the po educational policies are not getting defined by educational questions. Policies try to smooth over uncertainties of social and economic life by fixating on a response that can only ever be inadequate to the problem, because the problem is not purely an educational one to begin with. Really, if education is supposed to be able to fix problems, why hasn't it done so already? Is it really because we have failed to implement policy properly? Or is there something about the way we are viewing education itself that is the problem? So I do not want to minimize the overwhelming challenges facing youth today, so that's absolutely not my intention here. Along with the highest levels of inequality in 30 years, as I already mentioned, European states are increasingly facing difficulties to provide conditions for youth to live meaningful lives, where housing, uh, relationships, employment, and schooling have become factors of alienation instead of possibilities for contributing to one's own and others' flourishing. OEC statistics, for instance, in the country that I'm living in now, Ireland, point to extraordinarily high numbers of people who are what they term neat, neither in employment nor in educational and training, uh, at a whopping 22%. Uh, in Spain, it's 23%, uh, and in Greece, it's 21%. So these are severe social and economic problems, which I think need to find appropriate social and economic responses. While educa education has a clear role to play, as I will show below, I, it is not the one deemed by the instrumental assumptions of Eurovision education but one rooted, in my mind, in defense of an education as something other than learning, skilling, and training. So I'm going to be making two shifts here. A response that is educational, in the sense that I'm meaning it here, cannot be concerned primarily with skills and competences. So the first shift that needs to take place is thinking how problems of transition can be re-articulated as educational questions, and not simply assume that education is the answer to a problem that's already been defined elsewhere, by capitalist concerns, for instance. That is, the education field, teachers, researchers, students, need to boldly claim what the issues are on their own terms. On this view, perhaps transition is not the problem at all, but estrangement, disaffection, alienation, caused by overregulation, excessive testing, and pressures to become something or someone at the end of the day based on somebody else's vision of what they think that should be. And here I'm thinking also of teachers, not only of youth, uh, getting caught up and getting trapped within these systems. The language we use to articulate what matters in education needs to be rooted in education. Otherwise, we are posing somebody else's questions, singing someone else's song. To me, if we are going to take disaffection seriously, we need to confront the uncertainties youth are facing, not by skilling them up and telling them, now you're ready to face the world we have imagined for you, but by engaging that uncertainty honestly, directly, and with humility. By rethinking certain uncertainty, in short, from an educational vantage point. And this brings me to my second shift. This requires putting policies in place that respond to the human element in education. And I know that there's a, you know, I, I've done a lot of reading also in, in post-humanism recently, but I still think that education does have this something of a human quality to it that I'm, that I'm going to be arguing for here. In order to construct both viable and meaningful education, we cannot be focused primarily on behaviors, their measurement, their usefulness, their standardization, but need to focus on experience, the quality, the meaningfulness, the unpredictability. This means seeing skills and competences, since these terms are, you know, are with us in, our, in kind of our everyday educational language, from the perspective of this existential condition, and not from the perspective of their purported usefulness to a system that has been defined by other extrinsic to education's interests. 
So what transforms people's lives are not simply the skills or competences they obtain in an acquisition model of education, sort of as a series of behaviors that can then be trans over, transferred over into appropriate jobs, civic responsibilities, and the like. <coughs> skills and competences are only the tip of the iceberg in education. And here's a... Instead, what transforms people's lives, and there is where I have skills and competences and behaviors. Instead, what transforms people's lives are the unpredictable experiences of becoming. I don't know how many stories I've come across with youth and adult students, and I include my, my own story here, claiming that education is what changed them, made a difference in their lives. It is this they and I are not talking about learning a, a, in this, we're not talking about a, learning a particular skill, although that can be part of it, but about being engaged in a project that has meaning, that causes one to shift perspective, to, th to see th things that are familiar in unfamiliar ways, as Maxine Green would put it. Education, on this view, is an existential experience that is not something to be controlled that is, but that is open to surprise and uncertainty. While the knee-jerk reaction in facing grave social and economic problems is to suture over the uncertainties they bring through education, what I am suggesting is that it, we, it would be better if we accept uncertainty as a valuable feature of education itself and think about how that might actually inform educational policy from the bottom of the iceberg up. So in other words, Eurovision is just focused on the tip. All of European educational policy is being driven by the tip. And we're not engaging youth where it actually, to my mind, matters most. And that is in their lived realities, their lived lives. In other words, a response to uncertainty is to face uncertainty meaningfully and not to pacify it through a Eurovision lullaby. And so I'm going to be moving on. Oh, you get a whole, I got a whole picture there. I'm going to be moving on to, uh, to talking about the beginnings of uh, a different tune. And here is where the next two sections will get a little bit more into the kind of the philosophical perspective that I'm taking here. So to sum up thus far, I have argued for a different relationship between education and transition, different from the instrumental one that currently characterizes it, one that actually, as I'm saying, faces social and economic uncertainties by allowing the existential uncertainties of the educational process itself to inform how it is we ought to face them. Before turning to flesh this out more thoroughly, I want to briefly explore how transition as a term actually functions to support this view and should not be seen as merely something that belongs to Eurovision education's song lyrics. Transition always implies a state that one is transitioning from uh, and a state that one is transitioning to. From its Latin root, it denotes going across or over. And what we transition from is a state that is located in a past, that is open to interpretation, um, youth disaffection with education systems, unemployment, etc. While what one is transitioning to can only ever be speculation and projection of a future. We can't really know what we're transitioning to unless, you know, we're gods or something. Um, so it's by definition not entirely certain. However, it seems to me that if we are going to think about education beyond past tyrannies and future delusions, we need to think of the present as the appropriate time of education. Uh, and so the time of the present, as Hannah Arendt claims, is located in the gap between the two, between past and future. Jan Maschelein is in seeking to identify the time of education in the present, focuses specifically on Arendt's depiction of this gap, which is not the present as we usually understand it, he says, but a disruption in the supposedly continuous flow of time. And what disrupts the present is the assertion of one's own existence. That is, I am, I exist, I become, 
in the present. On Mascheline's reading of Arendt, it is the co-temporality of existence and the present that ought to lie at the heart of our educational endeavors. Indeed, this is what Mascheline calls the educational present, a time in which we become present. Although Mascheline asks us to suspend our interpretation of the world in order to experience the present, that space where we kind of come into existence, it is for me also a space inhabited by others of flesh and blood who are also making a life in the present. And such a life is interconnected, interdependent, and relational. The gap between past and future that is the educational present is neither something abstract or general for Arendt, but occurs as a specificity where speech and action occur. It's a moment. It, it happens at a, a particular place and time where existence can flourish as an interruption of our interpretations of the past and the illusory projections of the future. We become present not as a moment of continuous time, but as a disruption to the expectations that are laid out for us and by us. And so we were able to think and act anew. And we do so in the world with others, even if our achievements seem to belong to a solitary self. To put it in the terms of our topic here today, the educational present is about a life in transition. So not a transition from or a transition to, but a life in transition. It's a state of suspension from the tyrannies of dominant ideologies about what we are and what we should be, focusing on, and I'm putting place, an emphasis on the what. Transition instead is about who we are as relational subjects, etching out a life of meaning with others in complex and changing assemblages. Transition is thus not a one-off event, but is a continual process of change in which my existence is always involved in relation to others. Education, therefore, is concerned with practices that support such transition, that enable students to develop an orientation to life that is not reducible to the learning of individual skills and competences, but is focused on an approach to uncertainty that is both life-affirming and sustainable. So I'm wanting to think about education here uh, in transition. It deals, with, it deals with lives in transition. And as such, it's about an orientation. It's about opening up an orientation to life. It's not about merely the learning of discrete skills and, 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 and uh, competences. And so I want to move on to a song of change and uncertainty. And what is interesting about the word transition is that it also shares its Latin roots with the word transient. And I think this is my next slide, yeah. That which passes over. And it comes also from the French, the old French, passing without continuity. Transition and transience share, therefore, with the present, a sense of arising and passing away that is familiar to Eastern thought, particularly the Buddhist tradition. While the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who lived at the same time as the Buddha, understood the universe as being in continuous flux, what is worth drawing from the Buddhist position, uh, sorry, tradition more specifically is the idea not only of change, that the world is in flux, that things are never the same or stable, but of a constant appearance and disappearance, that things come and go, they emerge and they vanish. But more importantly, Buddhist philosophy, I think, offers a way of orienting ourselves to this uncertain world of transience by being in the present. So it has a real emphasis on being in the present, on awareness of the present. Now, it might seem strange to be going to Buddhist philosophy in the middle of a talk on Eurovision education, but I do think it helps to shift our perspective slightly to actually see what possibilities are there in order to reframe, rethink, reimagine what the educational 
present can, uh, entails and what uncertainty, facing uncertainty actually entails. Thus, in this section, I want to map out two primary aspects of uncertainty in relationship to this Buddhist understanding. And the first has to do with seeing education as about developing a sensibility to the world that both recognizes sort of transience as a central feature of experience and also has that educational dimension of allowing existence to come into the world. And the second, uh, which I'll get to uh, after that, is, has to do with seeing this orientation to transience as, an, as the aesthetic work of education. And here I will be do, introducing the phrase negative capability as it was coined by the poet John Keats as a way of framing this discussion. And so that, those are the two areas that I'm going to be looking at. And I think I have... That was, a li- that, that was a little bit rep- repetitive. Uh, there we go. And there we go. First, within the Buddhist philosophical framework, transience is one of the cornerstones of existence so that things pass and, and, and uh, arise and pass away is one of, is, is a central feature of our existence. Instead of seeing the vagaries of life as elements to control or overcome, Buddhism instead suggests practicing acceptance of life's uncertainties. Now such acceptance means facing head-on the difficulties such uncertainties bring as well as the beauty to be found in knowing how transient life is. We, in the proverbial West, might be inclined to think of such an attitude of acceptance as actually an acquiescence or a complacency in light of poverty, unemployment, discrimination, etc. So that in our ways of thinking, when we say we need to accept uncertainty, it means somehow that we're agreeing with it. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to suggest that in the Buddhist sense, un- accepting uncertainty doesn't have anything to do with agreeing with what one is, what, with the uncertainty, the state of uncertainty itself. So rather, it is the condition for agency, the condition for agreement or disagreement. And I think I have... It is because things are transient that we are called to action. Our lives are not lived in the imagined future, but in present with others. This focus on the transient nature of things means having to relinquish my certainty, but it does not mean relinquishing my responsibility. And this is primarily because for Buddhism, and I'm coming from a particular tradition within Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, I am deeply connected to the world around me and live a relational existence. That is the Buddhist position, and I think that it is one worth pursuing in order to reframe education beyond an instrumentalist model, is seeing education as concerned with an openness to uncertainty that is responsive to others with whom we share the world. So uncertainty doesn't mean that I am just concerned with my own uncertainties, or my own existential dilemmas. But it's actually my existential dilemmas are part and parcel of a relational sense of myself in the world. The Buddhist scholar Stephen Batchelor, writing about meditation, says something about this that I think speaks directly to education in my view. He writes, Meditation is not about gaining proficiency in technical procedures, but is the ongoing cultivation of a sensibility, a way of attending to every aspect of experience within a framework of ethical values. Now, one could almost substitute, I think, meditation with education here. That education is not about technical proficiency, skills and competences, but is something much broader, involving attending to experience in ways that are framed by a concern for others with whom we share the world. Such attending is an approach or an orientation to the world from which I am arguing we need to build our educational policies. So to think about the, the, the base of the iceberg, that's where we need to start building up our educational policies because it is this and not particular skills or competences where the transformational potential of education lies. So if education is transformational, as I think it is, and I think that most teachers would agree with that, and most students who have gone through the system in one way or another, um, that it's not necessarily the skills, it's this 
approach or an orientation to life that shifts. And for my second point, when we look at, oh, yeah, here we are. And for my second point, when we look at what creating such an orientation to the world entails, it is clear we are not talking about mere cognitive acquisition, but a way of attending to experience that is closer to what we consider to belong to an aesthetic as sensibility. And as I've discussed elsewhere, such sensibility was aptly rendered by the English poet John Keats as negative capability. And he writes, negative capability is when man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. And irritable here and, and the, 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 the time meant kind of impatient. <clears throat> On this account, there exists an open orientation to life that is not to be closed down by our too quick search for definite answers and explanations. We want, it, we, want, we want the answer. We want to be able to explain something immediately. We have a lot of difficulties just living with the uncertainty, with facing it. Uh, and without sort of... Um, uh, it's about creating, sorry, opportunities for accepting uncertainty without seeking to encapsulate it within categories of understanding, without rushing, in other words, to fact and reason. And as a capability, this term signals that such an orientation is about an adeptness, a way of being that can be encouraged and possibly cultivated. There is thus a deeply aesthetic dimension to this orientation to life and the world that does not map easily onto the conventional ordering of skills and competences so often presented in the Eurovision educational context as we have seen. That is, the aesthetic dimension of education is not to be confused with acquiring certain behaviors as it has to do with the existential experiences of our encounters with the world. And this is indeed whoops, what Stephen Batchelor calls the everyday sublime. It is the experience of confronting the excesses of the world, of noticing the world, which cannot be adequately captured through concepts, images, or words. As he says, they overreach us, spilling beyond the boundaries of thought. When we seek to order education into systems of performance and testing, the risk is that our experiences are not seen to have any value. They're, not, they're just simply not thought to be important. This, in my view, exacerbates the alienation and disaffection of youth from schools, civil society, and the workplace, since it does not tap into what is meaningful about life itself. As Bachelor cautions, for the human animal who delights and revels in her place, who craves security, certainty, and consolation, the sublime is banished and forgotten. As a result, life is rendered opaque and flat. Thus, the, uh, the attempt to place primary emphasis on skill acquisition in order to make the world more certain actually is in danger of turning education into a lifeless enterprise where youth become alienated from their own lives even further. So they learn skills in order to do the tests that will get them supposedly uh, jobs in the labor market. Moreover, Eurovision education misses an opportunity to really make education responsive to social and economic uncertainties because it prevents youth from developing their openness to uncertainty. We want to shut it down. We don't give time and space to exploring what those existential uncertainties uh, and how they're experienced by youth. So as I said earlier, what makes education a transformative process and we need, I think, to understand this if education is going to have sort of lasting effects, is not the type of skills or competences that are learned, but the qualities of experience that being educated, being educated enables. In this sense, an education in negative capability, what could be perhaps be called an aesthetic education in the everyday sublime, can provide us with a different register, a different key signature, if you like, through which to compose an alternative to Eurovision's tired refrains. Oh, sorry. I thought that was... I hope you saw that before. Um, and now for the finale. 
the singing out. I want to sketch out uh, where I see we can go from here, how research and policy can be informed by a practice to education that takes experience and more specifically an orientation to experience, that, that kind of openness that I'm suggesting, as the sine qua non of education's work of transformation. As discussed above, Eurovision education seems to have bracketed out the human element of education, and in so doing, only conceives of education as an instrument that services the larger social and economic systems of which it is a part. But what I've been arguing is that education is not an instrument, nor is it a subservient part of the, subs of the system, but a process of transition and change, and is necessarily engaged with the uncertainties of life. This transformational dimension of education places it in a unique position to respond meaningfully to the experiences of uncertainty that youth encounter. For this reason, seeing education primarily in terms of skills and competences that are oriented to the future deadens its potential, flattening it out into a monotonous tune of performance measurement and testing. Instead, in order to further its transformational potential, I have argued for developing an aesthetic approach where it is education's capacity to promote an orientation of openness to uncertainty in the present. What I am calling sort of facing uncertainty as a way of reframing our approaches to policy and research. Both research and policy concerned with transition need to focus more directly on addressing specifically educational questions, as I alluded to earlier, and resist tendencies to instrumentalize education. Easier said than done. As we have seen from the joint report, while there is much discussion on what education can do for the economy and society, it doesn't look at what's particularly human about educational context. That is, it doesn't build on what education already does, the practices that transform human lives in ways that make life more meaningful for many, both teachers and students. This is the experiential base rooted in practice upon which to build, that we need to build curricular reform and assessment practices. And research can't be complacent here if it is to contribute to changing the face of how we live through and optimally transform current Eurovision policy. This seems a daunting task, and I'm not naive about how the ET 2020 strategies feed into strategic research priorities of Horizon 2020, and how national funding agencies, in an attempt to get their share of the pot, are streamlining their own research agendas to fit more comfortably with these transnational goals. So it's, it, 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 it's a bit of a monster, basically. Nonetheless, it behooves us as researchers to respond to the flatness of Eurovision education by becoming more perhaps jazz-like, perhaps a little bit more improvisational in composing dissonant phrases that can begin to unravel the taken-for-granted melody that we all seem to be humming along to. What is important here is to focus on what it is we can do. And I have no illusions that Eurovision education will be totally reformed by a few research projects. But we can certainly take some responsibility in order not to worsen an already dire situation for many. It means attending to the actual lives of youth and their experiences by paying attention to the specific ways they exist and become as part of what I am calling the everyday sublime. Research with lives in transition not only provides an alternative to seeing transition as solely defined by the needs of economic exigencies, but responds with respect to the uncertainties bound up with their experiences in the present. Facing uncertainty in our research builds not on adopting the lyrics of Eurovision education as our own, but on listening to the voices of youth that are currently in the background in order to help them sing out and sing loud. Thank you.
the huge uploads uh, has been rated as an index of great success. Thank you very much for this very rich, very rich lecture. You offered us a huge amount for later reflection. Thank you very much. But before closing this session, let me offer you let me offer you a little present on behalf of European Education Research Association. Welcome, Sharon, and thank you very much.